Donna Reed is known not only for her roles in The Christmas Favorite, It's a Wonderful Life, and the beloved sitcom The Donna Reed Show, but also for her impactful life off screen. She was known for her soothing persona, and Reed was often viewed as America's mom. She provided a comforting presence to many during the turbulent 1950s and 60s, as people turned to TV to escape the world around them. Beyond her acting achievements, which earned her an Academy Award and a Golden Globe, Reed was a fervent anti-war activist. Her staunch opposition to the Vietnam War resonated with the public and contributed to the broader anti-war movement, which many believed helped hasten the end of the conflict, potentially saving countless lives. But none of this would have been possible if it wasn't for a dramatic moment on an airfield that saved her and maybe the United States from destruction. This is the warm, yet extraordinary story of how an Iowa farm girl became one of the most influential women in the world. Welcome to Hollywood Mysteries. The 1920s started on a somber note for rural residents of Iowa. Burdened by large debts from overpaying for land during the war, many farmers struggled as crop surpluses and tariffs suppressed market prices. Early indications of these tough times appeared in 1921, with some shops and denizens shutting down and others shifting to cash-only transactions. On February 9th, a local newspaper noted on an inside page, January 25th, born to Mr. and Mrs. William Mullinger, a girl. This first mention of Donna, like many to come, included a mistake. Donna Bell Mollinger was actually born on January 27th. When Donna Bell was just over a month old, her parents, Hazel and Bill Mollinger, relocated to his childhood residence in Nishnabotny Township. Living conditions for the Mollingers mirrored those of their ancestors, except for owning a car. Electricity wouldn't be installed until the late 1930s, around when Donabelle moved out. Communication with the outside world was maintained via a crank-up, battery-operated telephone. The house's primary heat source came from a living room furnace fueled by corn cobs, coal, and branches, which could send warmth to a bedroom upstairs through a floor vent. And the outdoor toilet was particularly unwelcoming during freezing winter months. Donabelle's bedroom upstairs was decorated with pictures of Greta Garbo, Clark Gable, and other film stars, as she dreamed of a glamorous life beyond Iowa. Nonetheless, the only fan letter she ever sent was to Anne Shirley, the young actress from Anne of Green Gables. By the time the 1920s had given way to the 1930s, all three Mullinger children were enrolled in Nishnabotna No. 3, a rural school a short walk from their home. The school was equipped with standard features, like a recitation bench, desks, a small library, and a blackboard. Despite what would now be considered primitive conditions, with boys and girls sharing an outhouse and a snake-attracting cyclone cave nearby, the education was solid. Rural students frequently outperformed their urban counterparts and mandatory 8th grade exams. The drought that began in 1930 and stretched almost a decade brought dust, pests, disease, and desperation. The Mullingers lost entire harvest to grasshoppers and were forced to euthanize their dairy cattle after they failed required tuberculosis tests. When most of their pigs contracted cholera, Bill Mullinger had to slaughter and incinerate them. No one was more profoundly impacted by the Great Depression than the farm girl who had become known as Donna Reed. Throughout her life, she was troubled by memories of livestock, crying for water, and watching neighbors pack their rickety cars with their few possessions to leave. One memory involved a young girl from a neighboring farm who came to inform Donna Bell that they could no longer play together because her family was moving away. Donna said she didn't know where they were going. They were simply leaving, giving up. In 1934, when she started high school in Denison, Donna Bell finally began to venture beyond her family's 120-acre farm. With no bus service available, and roads often blocked in winter, 
She stayed in Denison during the week with her grandmother. Donabel grew increasingly fascinated with the performing arts. Movies, however, seemed unattainable. She contemplated a career in radio instead, but her high school days allowed little room for idle dreams. Donabel honed her academic abilities to graduate among the top 10 of her class of 85 in 1938. Contrary to popular myths, Donabel Mollinger didn't drive a rickety old jalopy to California with only $60. She took a train, although likely with even less money. Upon her departure, her mother reportedly advised, Continue to be yourself, Donabel. I know we can rely on you, always to be a lady. Once in California, Donna's life was far from leisurely. The following two years at Los Angeles City College were filled with a demanding schedule. Witnesses to her college years were impressed by her endurance, managing her studies and work commitments, which exceeded 18 hours a day. At 18, Donna worked in the drama department's library, earning 35 cents an hour. She balanced her duties with household chores like scrubbing floors and cooking, followed by studying late. By fall of 1939, Donna was enrolled in 15 and a half academic units, while working 38 hours a week. Donna found herself with no other option but to make it work, even though the workload was grueling. Returning home wasn't feasible. It was 2,000 miles away, and she lacked the funds for a train ride back to an Iowa town that her former peers were eager to escape, but found themselves trapped in. Letting down her parents who were relying on her success wasn't an option either. That autumn, the highlight of her letters home was her first experience at a film studio, Metro Goldwyn Mayer in Culver City. Donna was among nine Los Angeles City College students, selected by producer Carrie Wilson to provide insights to the creators of a new Andy Hardy movie. She spent five hours at a meeting designed to connect Hollywood professionals with a few people from the real world. Donna described the studio to an Iowa friend saying, the studio lot is so mysterious. All the buildings are white, tall, close together, with few or no windows. I felt sort of pinned in. The actors from the series hosted the students for lunch at the MGM commissary. Donna excitedly reported back home. Gee, wasn't that fun? Mickey Rooney is so short. He isn't cute at all. He was awfully scared. Anne Rutherford was too sweet for words. She truly is a darb. She told us about herself, the school she went to, etc. Cecilia Parker ate with us too. I don't like her. She smokes. And of course she offered me cigarettes, but I'm still a non-smoker. And intend to remain one. When Frank Chotone walked by, she felt her heart missed a few beats. This visit foreshadowed a then unbelievable future, where Donna would star alongside Mickey Rooney in a Hardy film just a few years later. By February 1941, school was behind her, and Donna was at MGM again, brought in by Bill Smith, a representative from the Feldman Blum Agency. Just prior to leaving school, Donna had entered a beauty contest, and to her mild surprise, she had won. The photo did the rounds and ended up catching the eye of Smith, who promptly got in touch with her. There she encountered Billy Grady, the famed talent scout who had discovered stars like James Stewart and Joan Blondell. Impressed by her, Billy Grady was, as he said, taken by her great beauty. He noticed her nervousness and tried to relax her by recounting his visit to Denison, Iowa, where he stayed at a local hotel. Surprising his colleagues, he decided she warranted a screen test a rare opportunity usually reserved for more seasoned hopefuls. He admitted, it is seldom that a thousand dollar test is arranged for a hopeful with absolutely no experience. But Miss Mullinger had all the requisites and with a little coaching, she might come through. Two years and seven months after leaving her Iowa farm, Donna delivered incredible news to her family. She had secured a four year contract with MGM, starting at $75 a week with options for renewal every six months. Being only 20, she needed a judge's approval to sign the deal in early April, 1941. 
Overwhelmed by her good fortune, she confessed in a letter, Honestly, honey, I have to pinch myself every five minutes to believe it's true, and exclaimed, I guess I'm just about the luckiest person alive. Unlike some newcomers at MGM who spent more time posing for magazine spreads than acting, Donna was immediately cast in a film. She was chosen for the Jean Arthur role in a remake of the 1935 movie Public Hero No. 1, now renamed The Enemy Within. One morning in early June 1941, she discovered from the trade papers that her name had been changed to Donna Reed. This was done without her consultation, or even a courtesy call. She found this unfair and was not fond of her new name, even though it resonated more than Mullinger. However, she felt she had little say in the matter due to her sudden wild ride into Hollywood, so she accepted the change without complaint. Publicity for The Enemy Within, which had been renamed again to The Getaway, was already underway and it would be too late to change it. Donna later commented on her stage name saying, it has a cold, forbidding sound and described how she envisioned Donna Reed as a tall, cool, austere blonde. But from now on, she would have to get used to it because the name Donna Reed was going to get bigger and bigger. The getaway was unremarkable except for introducing Donna Reed and Dan Daly. In the film, he portrays her criminal brother who leads a gang disrupting defense plants, becoming the target of an undercover FBI agent. As might be expected, the FBI agent played by Robert Sterling falls in love with Donna's character before ultimately having to kill her brother. After the movie, the audience expressed their approval of Donna with feedback forms in the lobby stating, Miss Reed is a comer. Donna herself thought The Getaway was a fair B movie and felt her performance was adequate for a novice. In August 1941, she began working on a minor role in Shadow of the Thin Man. The ongoing popularity of the Thin Man series promised her exposure to a larger audience. Public recognition of Donna Reed slightly increased when Shadow of the Thin Man was released nationwide during Thanksgiving week. This installment, the fourth and not the best of the series, revolved around a murder at a racetrack and performed well commercially. Shot in sharp black and white by William Daniels and presented with the usual witty and dry touch of William Powell and Myrna Loy, it featured Donna as a secretary, looking stylish in a pillbox hat. Near the film's end, Stella Adler, a drama coach in a rare acting role as a gangster's girlfriend, looks at Donna and disdainfully remarks, Isn't she sweet? Already Donna was being typecast. While many were preparing for the first Christmas since America entered the war, Donna was busy filming. From early December 1942 through April 1943, she completed four movies back to back. The Courtship of Andy Hardy, Moki, Calling Dr. Gillespie, and Apache Trail. Her schedule was relentless, with work days extending to Saturdays making her comment that even Iowa farmers took more breaks. Donna's career could have accelerated faster at a different studio, but she meshed well with the family-oriented films that Louis B. Mayer, whose one longtime colleague labeled a sentimental tyrant, preferred. Mayer saw the MGM actresses as his daughters, provided they never defied him. In 1943, Donna married makeup artist William Tuttle. However, by 1944, their marriage was already nearing its end. Both Donna and Bill were still establishing their careers, and like many young couples of that era, decided to delay starting a family until after the war. This decision was influenced by the concern that the studio, while supportive, might not renew her contract if she became pregnant. Eventually, Donna did conceive, forcing them to choose between her career and having the child. They concluded that an abortion was necessary due to the poor timing. William remembered the decision as being clear-cut, though not without its emotional toll. A brighter chapter in Donna's career was her role in the picture of Dorian Gray. This film was Hollywood's first adaptation of Oscar Wilde's tale of a man's soul decaying along with his hidden portrait. 
Despite lacking major stars, the movie was highly literary and stylishly shot in black and white. It wowed audiences by showing glimpses of Dorian's portrait in color as it grotesquely transformed along with its degeneration. Donna's final film of 1944 was Gentle Annie, a well-made western based on McKinley Cantor's novel about two charming brothers who commit train robberies with assistance from their mother, portrayed by Marjorie Maine. Critics were conflicted about the film's moral tone, given its sympathetic portrayal of criminals. A few critics acknowledged its quality compared to typical westerns, but this did little to bolster Donna's career. Perhaps needing a more assertive representative, she hired Tony Owen, exactly the type of big-time, hard-hitting agent she needed. As she flew to Juarez on January 8, 1945, Donna kept her thoughts to herself. The following day, she finalized her divorce from Bill Tuttle, citing irreconcilable differences. She briefly mentioned to the press, this has been coming for a long time, while refusing to elaborate further, but it might have been her final opportunity to say anything. She was about to have a brush with death that would be enough to make anyone's blood run cold. On the evening of January 9th, she boarded a flight in El Paso. While waiting for the plane to depart, Donna was suddenly ushered out of the plane. A military officer required an emergency flight, and for reasons that remain unknown, she was the one who was obliged to make way for him. Never one to protest, she vacated her seat without fuss and got off the plane, well aware that during a time of war, this kind of emergency could be something vital to the war effort. She went back to the terminal and set about figuring out how to make her next connection, realizing she would have to stay a night in a local hotel before flying the following day. Early the next morning, the plane she was supposed to be on crashed into a mountainside near Burbank in dense fog, killing everyone aboard. Donna was already grieving the end of her marriage, but the shock of the plane crash made her acutely aware of her mortality, filling her with awe and questions about her fate. Why had she been spared? And for what purpose? Of all the people who could have been pulled off the flight, why did the crew pick her? Anyone who could answer the question with certainty was now dead. To Donna, who was always a believer in God, it could not seem like anything other than divine intervention, and she was even more determined than ever to use her life to make the world a better place. We'd like to take a moment to recommend this fantastic poster of It's a Wonderful Life, which would make a pretty great gift for Mother's Day, which is just around the corner. If you grab one via the Amazon link in the description, we get a small kickback at no extra cost to you, which really helps out the channel. Otherwise, why not check out the links to our pics of Donna Reed films, currently available on Amazon, also in the description. We think her film scandal sheet is a pretty great pulpy noir. Have a watch and come back to let us know what you think. But back to the video. Now single, Donna, much like the country post-war, saw new opportunities. Her love life was increasingly intertwined with Tony Owen, her agent. She was thrilled by his energy and handsome features. Despite their differences in background, temperament, and interests, the attraction was undeniable. Donna found herself both drawn to and resistant to Tony's charms. After he became her agent, they often clashed over her career decisions and script choices. The exact moment she fell deeply and uncontrollably in love is unclear, but as she once admitted, she was longing for excitement. Tony with his dark hair, saddle leather eyes, as she described them, and a rugged demeanor was irresistibly appealing. Donna confessed to a relative that marrying Tony might lead to unhappiness, yet not marrying him would make her completely miserable. Director Frank Capra immediately knew he wanted Donna Reed for the role of Mary Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life. Both Jean Arthur and Ginger Rogers had been rejected for the part for being colorless and bland, but Capra saw something different in Donna, a mature, enduring femininity, unlike the bold characters he had previously directed. She looked like she'd fall in love with a man and love him forever, he remarked. 
It's a Wonderful Life was the most challenging job she had undertaken. Capra pushed Donna hard, leveraging her perfectionist tendencies to the brink of exhaustion. In 1946, at 25 years old, Donna portrayed Mary Bailey, across ages 18 to 40, requiring her to sing, dance, and swim, skills she had not previously mastered. Neither Capra nor her co-star, James Stewart, could offer Donna the support she needed. Years later, she would reflect on the tense atmosphere on set, saying, everybody was looking for approval, but nobody was in a position to give it, and confessed, I was terrified most of the time. In June 1946, Donna asked Capra for a brief leave amid filming. She and Tony were about to adopt a baby girl. It seems hard to imagine now, given the film's iconic status, but at the time, reception was underwhelming, for it's a wonderful life. The disappointment was felt by all, and Jimmy Stewart felt that Donna was to blame for its failings. Stewart had been contemplating abandoning acting, as something frivolous after his experiences in the war had given him a taste for the battlefield, albeit the aerial one. He thought the choice of a young co-star was not befitting his big reunion with Capra, but Donna is now cemented in cinema history as Mary Hatch. In 1948, all studios were forced to reduce their budgets and staff due to a downturn in the film industry. Donna Reed, unlike Lucille Ball, and 123 other contracted players, managed to avoid being cut from MGM's roster. With no immediate roles available at MGM, Paramount cast her alongside Alan Ladd once more. Chicago Deadline was a product of the changing post-war film industry focusing on narrative over costly production techniques. The film was described as realistic, a departure from the idealized tone of It's a Wonderful Life, economically filmed on location in Chicago. The production utilized movie tone cameras hidden in city streets to capture sound and image simultaneously. In this film, Donna and Alan Ladd never actually shared a scene together. Donna's character is already deceased when Ladd's character, a journalist, discovers her in a rundown boarding house. He pieces together her life, using flashbacks triggered by entries in her diary. Donna had a loyal fan base by now. Her fans would attend her sporadic radio appearances and give her flowers. Her activities were even chronicled in a fan publication, cleverly named Donna's Reader. In July 1949, she welcomed her son Timothy but the joy soon turned to pain when a virus affected her knees post-delivery. She was bedridden for weeks and later struggled with mobility using crutches. After suffering severe reactions to sedatives and procaine injections, she explained, Ray Milan's experiences in Lost Weekend were mild compared to mine with Nimbutal. Not only did I see things crawling on the ceiling, I rode up and down a fast elevator went into tailspins, looped the loops, and found myself clinging to the bed in order to stay in bed. For two hours, I had a real bender. In 1950, Donna was keen to resume her film career, aware that her best years for landing significant roles might be passing. While recovering, she sifted through numerous scripts, realizing that true excellent ones were a rare find. By July, she was under contract with Columbia Pictures, and reluctantly got pushed into doing The Hero with John Derrick, a push likely influenced by Tony, who had been working at Columbia as an assistant to the studio president, Harry Cohn. Tony seemed to have a favorable view of the often disliked Cohn, who infamously claimed he could pave Gower Street with the bones of those he had crushed. In Saturday's Hero, Donna was cast as the aristocratic Melissa. The original script faced objections from the Breen office, due to concerns that Melissa's close relationship with her controlling uncle implied incest. The issue was resolved by directing Donna and Sidney Blackmer to use specific postures, movements, and glances that highlighted their power struggle without sexual connotations. Saturday's Hero presented other challenges. It criticized corruption in college sports leading Ivy League schools to deny filming on their campuses. The filmmakers had to construct the setting using various campus backdrops. The film didn't achieve commercial success, 
This was partly because just as the movie hit theaters, producer Sidney Buckman was testifying before the House of Un-American Activities Committee about his past Communist Party membership. He refused to name others or plead the Fifth Amendment, leading to picketing at theaters by unidentified groups, all of which frustrated Harry Cohn, as he couldn't work out who to sue. Donna next appeared in Raiders of the Seven Seas, a B-movie filmed far from any body of water. Then, before the year ended, she worked on Trouble Along the Way for Warner Brothers. As it starred John Wayne and was directed by Michael Curtis, it wasn't considered a B-movie, but nevertheless, it wasn't very successful. It felt like a career dead end was looming before her, but once again, a sudden turn was about to throw her center stage. Few were aware of Donna's lengthy battle for a groundbreaking role later that year. Despite the slim chances and contrary to her wholesome image, she auditioned for the role of the prostitute Alma, and from here to eternity. Director Fred Zinnerman treated her as merely a prop during her audition. Then came a dreadful silence, Donna later recalled, noting that no one from Columbia had even called to say thanks. She had dyed her hair black for the audition but had to bleach it afterwards because Curtis preferred a blonde for trouble along the way. Months later, Cohen insisted she audition again with Aldo Ray, this time with black hair, and told her, don't ask any questions, just do it. After more silence, Cohen abruptly offered her the role of Alma late one Friday night in February 1953. She was instructed to start rehearsals the following Monday morning. Donna felt like an outsider on the set of From Here to Eternity. She was aware that her presence was primarily due to Harry Cohn's influence, which set her apart from the others. Additionally, she found it challenging to blend in with some of the cast members, who were known for their fast living and hard drinking habits. Although Montgomery Clift was professionally supportive, the environment never felt like home to her. Her most daunting moment on set was during the final shipboard scene with Deborah Kerr, during rehearsals, she was so intimidated that she nearly excused herself to leave and re-enter. This was the first time in her career that she felt overwhelmed by the stature of a fellow actress. Cohn focused the film's publicity on Donna. By August, she graced the cover of Life magazine, and it was clear something big was happening. From Here to Eternity premiered that month and continued to draw attention throughout 1953 and 1954. Donna was present at the New York premiere at the Capitol Theater, where her name was featured alongside Burt Lancaster's. The theater, capable of holding nearly 5,000 people, saw continuous full houses, setting a record for its opening run. On the evening of March 25, 1954, she won an Academy Award for her role as Alma. Every camera present captured her moment of triumph. After Walter Brennan called her name, and she ran from the back of the theater to the stage. Despite the professional acclaim, the time from May 1953, when filming wrapped, to February 1954, when she received her Oscar nomination, was marked by various struggles. Donna described this period as agonizing. Her marriage to Tony grew increasingly strained, and figures like Cohn, who she likened to a little dictator, continuously reminded her of their dominance. Donna Reed's career really shows the industry's difficulty in appreciating a leading lady who is beautiful yet smart, intelligent yet approachable, and strong yet feminine. Donna was truly unique at a time when there was a scramble among studios to sign the next bombshell or sex symbol. Donna's subsequent roles included Gun Fury, shot in June with Rock Hudson, an actor on the rise, she recognized this pairing as a sign that her career peak might be behind her, as studios often matched actresses nearing the end of their prime with up-and-coming male stars. Directed by Raoul Walsh, Gun Fury was set against the stunning Arizona landscape and featured dramatic scenes of fistfights and rattlesnake attacks, though it offered little else of note. Another modestly budgeted western, They Rode West, cast Donna opposite Robert Francis, a young actor gaining attention after his role in the Kane Mutiny. Tragically, he would later perish in a plane crash. Like Gun Fury, Bay Road West was well-crafted, but unremarkable. 
At 33, Donna felt a strong desire for more substantial romantic roles and another child, as time was not on her side. She had hoped to star alongside Kirk Douglas in Heaven Knows Mr. Allison, portraying a nun marooned with a marine on an island. Tony was close to acquiring the screenplay when the owner suddenly decided to exercise his option, and the role eventually was given to Deborah Kerr. Donna also aspired to play the Eurasian doctor, and love is a many splendored thing, a role she missed out on, although decades later the film's title song would be played at her funeral. Donna's debut as a freelance actress was in The Last Time I Saw Paris, a lavish MGM production filled with vividly colored bistros and boulevards. While parts of the film were shot in Paris and on the Riviera, she didn't travel abroad for the filming. She portrayed an extremely rigid American Puritan living in Paris with her submissive husband. They care for their niece, the daughter of her late sister, played by Elizabeth Taylor, whose death was caused by her alcoholic writer husband, portrayed by Van Johnson. Previously at MGM, Donna had watched her career progress steadily upward. However, as a freelancer, she realized that her career's trajectory hinged on unpredictable factors such as luck, investment, and personal choices. She turned down a role in Around the World in 80 Days because she felt another ethnic character so soon after playing Sacagawea might not be wise. Shirley MacLaine took the part of the Indian princess and gained widespread acclaim in what became the biggest film of 1956. At the same time, Donna appeared in Backlash, which was much less successful. The Benny Goodman story brought Donna back together with William Daniels, the cinematographer who had first shot her in Shadow of the Thin Man, and then she moved on to one of her most challenging film shoots. Beyond Mombasa turned out to be somewhat of a cursed film. Filming in Africa was easier than for the earlier Trader Horn, thanks to the established MGM office in Nairobi. Nonetheless, the conditions were harsh, causing discomfort and illness that frayed tempers. The film's director, George Marshall, belonged to the rugged style of John Ford, but without Ford's flair. He frequently drank Pernod and tampered with the script. A reliable source disclosed that Marshall treated Donna like a novice and showed no respect for her as a person, embarrassing her in front of the crew. When Marshall later tried to contact her in the United States, she refused to speak to him. Later, she would contractually bar his involvement with the Donna Reed show. Donna welcomed her daughter, Mary Ann, on May 7th, 1957. After longing for this child for so long, she now worried, albeit unnecessarily, that she might not have enough to offer her fourth child. At 37, Donna's beauty still shone brightly, yet she felt a significant chapter of her career drawing to a close. Time is a terrible enemy in this business, and I don't want to be fighting it too much longer, she confided. I'll leave that to Dietrich and Rogers and Crawford. I haven't the energy to worry about every light and lens on the camera to ensure that dewy look. Then an important moment came when John Mitchell, a vice president at Columbia, New York, spotted a photograph in Tony's office. It showed a joyful, windswept Donna on the Iowa farm, surrounded by her children and her younger sister, Karen, who were petting a lamb. The image convinced Mitchell that Donna's real-life role as a wife and mother was the perfect persona to portray, only not in films, but on television. He faced the challenge of convincing both the star and the producers. Donna would be portrayed in plain house dresses, primarily confined to the kitchen setting, not exactly the natural environment of a major movie star. Initially, she thought Mitchell's idea was a joke, until she recognized its genuine appeal. So a photograph blew up Donna's career for the second time. Opting for the Donna Reed show, as the title was bold, given the rarity of women leading television shows by their names at the time. In the show's description, she was to embody a wife, mother, companion, booster, nurse, housekeeper, cook, laundress, gardener, bookkeeper, clubwoman, choir singer, PTA officer, scout leader, and at the same time, effervescent, immaculate, and pretty, a role seemingly requiring more abilities than Superman. 
She would head a typical American family in a small Midwestern city. The family included teenage Mary, characterized as mercurial romantic, and the younger, serious and tense, Jeff, who was expected to display more exuberant behavior. Casting Dr. Alex Stone, the husband, proved challenging. Donna insisted from the start on a male lead who commanded respect, vehemently opposing the cliché of the foolish sitcom husband and father. She even disliked the term situation comedy, due to the stereotypes it suggested. Carl Betts from the Eastern theater scene fit the role well with his blend of sharp intelligence and subtle humor, a rare combination. His robust and straightforward demeanor made him a fitting counterpart to the petite Donna. Despite her extensive experience, Donna felt apprehensive. She had never before taken on the primary responsibility of leading a show, had minimal experience in comedy, and had rarely worked with child actors regularly. Additionally, she was co-owner of the production company, like Lucille Ball, and was overwhelmed by the myriad details of the job. Moreover, she was torn between her family and career. She continued to feel guilty about deserting Marianne, who was just 18 months old as the series began. The Donna Reed show made its debut at 9 p.m. on Wednesday, September 24th, 1958. The initial reception from critics was quite critical. One remarked, probably a nice family to live with, but you wouldn't want to visit them for laughs while another backhandedly praised Donna as the best thing to come from Iowa since Herbert Hoover. After the fourth episode aired, the sponsor, a representative from Campbell's Soup, called in when Tony mentioned the awful Nielsen ratings. The Campbell's representative responded with a dismissive, what's that, and reassured them, we don't care about the ratings. Keep working. Don't collapse. In a time when sponsors wielded significant influence, Campbell's support was crucial. By late November, after airing eight episodes, the show started to improve in ratings. This uptick in viewership coincided with more favorable reviews. A particularly positive review came at just the right time during that first winter. A critic for TV Guide praised, in an era when wisecracking, brash, and brassy blondes infest the air like locusts, Miss Reed, corn-fed and wholesome, is as welcome as a late summer breeze through an Indiana hayfield. The show gradually won over the public, notably without any major changes to its format or resorting to gimmicks, despite network and studio pressures. Donna insisted on maintaining the show's authenticity to everyday family life, much like the one she might have led had she stayed in Iowa. Over eight seasons and 274 episodes, Donna Stone remained a comforting figure on American television, becoming a fixture in homes nearly as enduringly as real mothers. One touching letter from a viewer in 1967, which Donna saved in her scrapbook, expressed, I have always pretended in my heart that you were my mother because you're so pretty, understanding, thoughtful, warm, kind, and gentle, something I've never had in a mother and I've needed so deeply. During five awful years, it was you who helped me. After wrapping up the final episode, Donna reflected, I am happy to have finished that eight-year episode of my life. I was eight years at MGM, four years at Columbia, four years at Universal. Wonder what the next four or eight years will bring. At 45, Donna relished the newfound luxury of sleeping in and starting her mornings leisurely with two cups of coffee. She was profoundly tired after being constantly engaged since she was 17, through college, working, filming, and raising a family. Yet the mild and conservative farm girl would be taking on a surprising role in this new chapter of her life. In 1966, the Vietnam War intensified, with the US transitioning from an advisory role to active combat. A grim tally in one April week alone saw nearly a hundred American soldiers killed. By summer, troop numbers in Vietnam had risen to 125,000, with 35,000 new draftees each month. Donna found herself deeply affected by the war broadcasts. I sat and suffered silently, but felt absolutely paralyzed, except for voting, she later recounted. 
That year, Donna voted against her friend Ronald Reagan, who was running for governor of California as a Republican. She voiced her concerns to Reagan about his criticism of young anti-war protesters, to which he responded indifferently. But that's what people want to hear. Donna was particularly appalled when he suggested using full technological resources, implying nuclear options, to end the conflict in Vietnam. She found the GOP's shift too far right for her taste. Yet she stayed a registered Republican to strategically oppose the more extreme candidates in the primaries. Donna's sons were soon of age to be drafted. Without any pressure from her, both resisted. Tony Jr.'s deep mistrust of the government influenced Donna to rethink the U.S. role in Vietnam. Initially, she thought he should serve in a non-combat role, but he persuaded her of the moral contradictions in that position. Even as a conscientious objector, he faced such stress that it led to high blood pressure. Timothy, younger by several years, tried to remain in college under the constant scrutiny of the draft board. It was a time of great pain for all of us, Donna reflected later. After much deliberation, Donna joined a Beverly Hills group, called Another Mother for Peace. Despite criticisms from those close to her who deemed the group radical or feminist, and with Tony's strong disapproval, she recognized that women could potentially play a significant role in ending the war. The organization, founded early in 1967 by 16 women at Barbara Avedon's dining table, rapidly grew to a national membership of 285,000. Donna eventually became a co-chairman. This group of mothers were composed and rational protesters. They did not march, picket, or resort to name-calling. Instead, they sent floods of well-researched letters to Congress advocating for peace. Donna's commitment to the anti-war cause deepened. She actively supported congressmen who advocated for cutting war funds. She threw her energy into the campaign of Representative George Brown of California. During the 1970 Senate race, Brown contested the Democratic primary against John Tunney, but lost, failing to challenge the incumbent George Murphy. Donna hosted fundraising dinners for Brown and co-chaired his campaign in Southern California. His loss left her feeling depleted and disheartened. She criticized the Democratic establishment for choosing John Tunney, who she described as a standard plastic war hawk, over George Brown, whom she revered as a man of pure gold with an impeccable voting record. As 1969 came to a close, the Owen family underwent big changes. In September, Donna and Tony decided to end their marriage. Later that month, their son Tim, feeling disconnected from conventional society, impulsively married a woman resembling Bridget Bardot. In November, their daughter Penny got married and moved to San Francisco. And in the same week, Tony Jr. left their home on Alpine Drive. Now just Donna and her daughter Mary remained at home. During this period, Donna engaged in some of her most significant activism with another mother for peace. In the autumn of 1970, a member from the Midwest found a map in a niche publication that detailed vast petroleum reserves off the coasts of Vietnam, Thailand, and Cambodia, raising questions about the motives behind American foreign policy and the pursuit of oil profits. Donna and Dorothy Jones, who had experience in the Office of War Information, dedicated months to investigating. They scoured lesser-known publications and consulted experts from Stanford, UCLA, and the Bay Area Institute. It appeared that the South Vietnamese government was on the brink of granting offshore drilling rights, and American oil companies were eagerly awaiting these opportunities. Donna suspected President Nixon was closely aligned with oil interests. It's a big, bad, ugly picture, she told a friend. We are gathering facts which are hard to get. Did you know oil companies keep dossiers on all office holders and all persons speaking against them? By the winter of 1971, Donna and Dorothy had compiled their findings and published them in the Another Mother for Peace newsletter. The headline questioned, Are our sons dying for offshore oil? They challenged readers with a tough inquiry. Do we continue to sustain the highly unpopular Tayo Kai regime in order to allow U.S. oil companies to obtain the offshore oil leases? 
Privately, Donna believed this issue was crucially relevant to the persistent delays in resolving the Vietnam War. Publicly, she clarified, We haven't accused anyone of going into the war because of oil. We just want to be sure we're not compelled to stay in Vietnam because of it. Oil companies today have contrived to turn Vietnam into one of the region's major oil-producing nations. The outcome of the actual war, notwithstanding. Donna Reed's firm opposition to the Vietnam War was well known throughout the nation, so her friends were more than a little surprised when she began dating a man who had served as a military advisor in Vietnam, Colonel Grover Woodrow Asmus. First noticed Donna at a birthday celebration for the architect William Pereira. The room was crowded, and to begin there were no formal introductions. The colonel didn't recognize her at first, but couldn't stop looking her way until she signaled to him by waving her hand, which he noticed lacked a wedding ring. Grover, a divorced man and senior aide to General of the Army Omar N. Bradley, expressed his interest to Mrs. Bradley, who then called Donna saying that the general wanted to meet her. This was in 1971, and from then on, Grover proposed to Donna nearly every day for three years. On one occasion, he sent her 500 birthday cards, from various locations. Donna felt at ease with Grover, recognizing him as a mature and worldly suitor. Though she was cautious about marrying again, she admitted that everyone has flaws and she needed to understand his fully, especially since they had differing views on the Vietnam War. Grover later described Donna as opposed to stupid political decisions, not anti-military. However, even in 1972, Donna acknowledged that their differences were intensified by the peace negotiations related to the war, and she knew it would take time to resolve these issues. One evening, while dining at LaGrange Restaurant on Westwood Boulevard, and waiting for their friends Delmer and Mary Lou Daves, Grover playfully said, It's time for my daily exercise. Will you marry me? Donna finally agreed, joking, You've worn me down. Yes, I still haven't found your dark side, but I think I can live with it when it does pop up. They married on August 30th, 1974, at Donna's home with only close family and friends present. After their honeymoon at the Bel Air Hotel, they split their time between Los Angeles and Seattle, where Grover worked for Alyeska Pipeline Service Company, involved in constructing the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. This marked a significant shift for Donna, from anti-war activists critical of big oil to being married to a man who worked in the industry. Grover's influence seemed to revive Donna's moderate conservatism and her previous staunch opposition to big oil softened. While I doubt we need that oil, I frankly think the pipeline can be done safely, ecologically speaking. Donna remarked after reviewing the safety plans and precautions laid out for the highly controversial pipeline that when it was built, had a major impact on the natural world and nearby native peoples. Living on an island in Washington, Donna drifted away from another mother for peace. She engaged her mind by entering the stock market, impressing her brokers by profitably trading options, while other investors faced losses. This endeavor required constant attention, but could be managed from anywhere. In April 1977, Eager to leave Seattle's perpetually gray skies, Donna was pleased when Grover transferred to Irvine, California. They purchased a beach house in Corona del Mar, the place she chose to spend her later years. In the 1970s, Donna gradually leaned towards making a comeback in the film industry. Initially, she had ambitions to produce, a feature film about a grandmother in Creole country, and a documentary on Ishii, the last member of his California tribe. However, plans for a Donna Reed show reunion faltered. In July 1977, an agreement was struck with Columbia and ABC to produce a serious drama with the cast of the Donna Reed show. They had settled on a theme and hired a writer, but the project came to a halt when Donna found out that Carl Betts was dying of lung cancer. It was a profound shock especially since he had appeared healthy at their regular lunch just a month earlier. After Carl passed away in January 1978, 
Various scripts were drafted and revised, yet the reunion series without its father figure never materialized. Five days before Christmas in 1982, Donna began shooting Deadly Lessons. At first, she struggled to connect with her role as a stern authoritarian headmistress at an elite girls' school. She remarked on the decline in television production quality since her earlier days, noting, Working conditions in TV are horrible. The schedules are tighter and shorter than ever, and lamented that the attention and care given to her old show now seemed like a luxury from another era. In late spring of 1984, Donna was surprised to receive a call from the producers of Dallas. Breaking her usual protocol, she attended an interview and impressed the Dallas team, who had considered and dismissed 500 other candidates before her. In early June, she signed on to portray the matriarch of South Fork. The intense media coverage that followed heightened expectations and made Donna anxious. Headlines like, Donna Does Dallas, were widespread, and the media hype ensured a large audience for her debut as the new Miss Ellie. In classic 1980s soap opera fashion, Miss Ellie returned to the screen looking completely different, suddenly transformed into the glamorous and beautiful form of Donna Reed. Initially, she looked great in photographic tests, However, the actual filming conditions differed, and Donna was displeased with her on-screen appearance. It is a gentleman's agreement when you and the producer and cinematographer agree on the result of a test, which should not be broken, and never has been in my experience until now, she confided to a friend. The situation worsened when the Dallas team inaccurately blamed the cinematographer, who disclosed that he hadn't been permitted to shoot her as he had during the tests. By early 1985, though her filming conditions had improved, her screen time had been reduced significantly. Viewers started noticing her absence from major plot lines. Despite rumors suggesting she was acting like a prima donna, Donna had always been far from it. She was a consummate professional who simply disliked being misled. While vacationing in Paris, Donna was surprised when her phone rang and she heard her agent Wilt Melnick, on the other end. He had just had lunch with the producers of Dallas and informed her that the show was returning to the core cast. Confused, Donna asked him to clarify. They fired you, Melnick explained. Donna was shocked and questioned why, especially since she had a two-year contract remaining. Melnick explained that no reason was given. Though Melnick delivered the news gently, Donna felt it as a harsh blow. I felt as if someone had opened a trap door, and I was falling through, spinning crazily as I tumbled, she would later describe the feeling. Feeling betrayed after 44 years in the industry, she was upset that the producers had not given her any options, or the courtesy of informing her directly, even though they knew where she was. The news quickly became public. By the next day, the European media reported on her firing, Lorimar claimed it was due to declining ratings, a claim Donna knew to be false as episodes featuring her more prominently had higher ratings. Humiliated, she wanted to fly home immediately, but Grover persuaded her to stay and try to relax amidst the media storm. Adding to her woes, Paris was cold and Donna was still recovering from the flu. While crossing the street in the City of Light, she was knocked down by a motorcyclist mugger who stole her purse and now she was without her passport, money, and personal items. The summer of 1985 was consumed with court hearings. Donna's lawyer sought an injunction to prevent any other actress from appearing as Miss Ellie, which was widely misreported as aiming to block the entire production. However, in June, a superior court judge denied the injunction. Three months after her firing, Laura Marr and Donna's lawyers agreed she would receive her regular salary. For the next two years, and be free to work elsewhere. Donna found this resolution fair and was content. That summer, Donna's health deteriorated due to stress. I have felt God awful, but I feel it is merely all the endless stress of the past three months, not to mention the previous year's work on that mean show. My gastric system is in an uproar, a first for me, she wrote in a letter in late July. 
Her stomach issues persisted, and in September, another specialist implicated an ulcer. Despite her health concerns, Donna tried to maintain normalcy at home, but a week later, a severe symptom emerged, and Grover urgently took her to a specialist who directed them to Cedar Sinai Medical Center. There, after a CAT scan and ultrasound, doctors discovered a cancerous mass on her pancreas. On the evening of October 31st, doctors informed Grover that Donna had about six months to live. A surgical procedure was carried out to alleviate Donna's discomfort. A few days after the operation, the surgeon informed Donna of her pancreatic cancer, but did not pronounce it terminal, which allowed her to hold on to some hope. Despite her reduced energy, she maintained her composure, always appearing well-groomed and dressed neatly in her robe, and she tried to keep everyone around her in good spirits. By December, Donna's health was declining rapidly, yet she remained clear-minded. She expressed frustration about her occasional confusion, saying, I just hate it when I can't think clearly. On December 20th, the news of Donna's illness was released to the public. Around the same time, Donna's doctor was informing Grover that she had even less time than initially expected. On the evening of January 11th, Tony Jr. visited and they watched a game show on TV together. After the show, Donna mentioned she was tired and they said their good nights. As I walked out of the house that night, I knew it would be the last time I would see my mother. I also realized that she knew the same. I sat in my car and cried, Tony Jr. recalled. The following day, a Sunday, Donna met with the local Presbyterian minister, concerned about securing a birthday gift for Shelley Fabres. That evening, she spoke on the phone with her daughter Penny for the last time, telling her, You've been a wonderful daughter. On Monday morning, as Shelley was en route to Canada with Mike, she stopped by but did not see Donna. Give her this rose and tell her I love her, she requested of Grover. Later that day, Grover drove Donna to the doctor's office, where she appeared somewhat more lively. Grover had to attend a board meeting for the West Point Society that evening, and upon his return, Donna's condition seemed unchanged. However, on January 14th, the nurse appeared in the doorway and informed the family, I think we've lost her. Donna passed away just two weeks shy of her 65th birthday. Her grave, marked by a simple stone, lies just a few feet from Natalie Woods. Nearby are the mausoleums of Daryl Zanuck and his wife Virginia, and almost directly north, aligned with Donna's final resting place, is the vault containing Marilyn Monroe's remains. During her peak on the Donna Reed show, Donna Reed was like America's mother. At a time when studios were scrambling to cash in on the most provocative female stars, Donna completely bucked the trend and became a unique figure, beautiful but wholesome, kind, down to earth, and extremely hardworking. And she showed that she could cut it with the very best, particularly in From Here to Eternity. Few actresses have generated as much genuine warmth and love from their fans as Donna Reed, and although she passed away much too soon, it seems fate pulled her out of that doomed plane for a much bigger reason. We hope you enjoyed this deep look at the life of Donna Reed. If you want to help out the channel, then please consider becoming a YouTube member or joining our Patreon. Starting from $1 a month, you'll get access to exclusive content, like photos and mini essays on the history of Tinseltown as well as polls to vote on future videos and discounted merch. Check out our $3 membership or Patreon tier for our Hollywood history series, for example. Links are in the description, and any amount is a huge help when it comes to keeping the channel going. We are very grateful to all of you who have signed up so far. That's all for this episode of Hollywood Mysteries. Sweet dreams. Yeah.